anniversaries this month of July and thank for their life that God will extend their life. Uh, my sons in the Philippines is their wedding anniversary today. So I just Amen. greeted them. Happy anniversary. God will bless you more. And, and thank God for that. Uh, let us pray. We welcome everybody. All the angels around us will join us. Uh, okay, Father God, thank you for today because this is the day that you have made for us to praise you and worship you. Lord, and thank, thank you for replacing those negative thoughts in our mind. Thank you that you will put the positive thoughts so we can move on. And thank you for for putting, bringing down the holy fire on our hearts so that this, this holy fire will work in us every day so we can do what you want us to do, O oh Lord Jesus. Thank you so much. Humbling ourselves before you, O oh God. Thank you that you always forgive us. Hallelujah. We pray that everybody will be blessed today. And I, I pray, Lord, the service today will be a blessed and fruitful service. And everybody that hear your words, hear your message, Lord, will be planted in their hearts, O oh God, and they will follow you, O oh Lord Jesus. Because anything that is coming from you, O oh Lord, is a blessing, is an encouragement to everybody. And thank you. Whoever your message, uh, messenger today, oh God, thank you that you bless him, uh, anoint his lips, oh God, that everything he will say coming from you, oh God, and thank you, Lord, and cover him with your precious blood and let your cross be uh, in front of him and behind him, oh God, thank you so much, we bless and praise your name. We give all the praises and glory. Lord, even those people, their spirits are not here. Let them feel, oh God, touch them so that they will feel you need them in this place. Not because of their presence, their spirit. So, so that they can feed also their spirit with your messages. And thank you. We, we give you praise and glory. Glory to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's just stand. Let's just welcome the Lord with praise this morning. How about you in your own words? Just begin to worship Him. Thank you, God, for your presence, Lord, this morning. Thank you, God, for this room. Fill every corner, every space. We dedicate this place to you right now, Lord God. May your spirit live here. May your spirit be welcome here. Your praise inhabit this place, Lord God. Drive out every darkness, every evil thing from our heart, from this room right now, Lord God. Let us just be with you together and alone with you, Lord, right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. His love never fails, amen. Let's worship him together, church. This with me higher than the mountains, higher than the mountains that I face, stronger than the powers of the grave, constant in the trial and the chains. And one thing, one thing remains, and one thing remains, one thing remains your love never fails and never gives up never runs out on me your love never fails and never gives up never runs out on me your love never fails and never gives up never runs out on me your love hallelujah amen and on and on and on and on it goes. Oh, it overwhelms and satisfies my soul. 
And I never ever have to be afraid One thing remains Say one thing remains One thing remains Your love never fails and never gives up Never runs out on me Your love never fails and never gives up Never runs out on me Oh, your love never fails and never gives up Never runs out on me Your love Sing on and on and on And on and on and on and on it goes Yes, it overwhelms and satisfies my soul And I never ever have to be afraid One thing remains One thing remains Your love, your love never fails It never gives up, it never runs out on me Your love never fails, it never gives up Never runs out on me Your love never fails and never gives up Never runs out on me Your love Sing in death and in life In death, in life I'm confident and covered by the power Of your great love Oh my debt is paid there's nothing that can separate my heart your great love your love never fails and never gives up never runs out on me your love never fails and never gives up never runs out on me your love never fails and never gives up never runs out on me your love. Let's sing that together one more time as a church. Well, your love never fails and never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up, never runs out on me. Yes, your love never fails and never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love. Are you ready to do the will of God? Are you ready that God is going to do great things and His will be done in your life? I am ready. I'm ready to receive the will of God in my life to be done. Amen? Because there's a promise of blessing. Remember that. The blessing of God for all of us is, is to redeem you is to give you that grace and for you to be restored and for you to have that wonderful, wonderful promise of God in your life, which is the blessing of joy, the blessing of hope, the blessing of, um, the blessing of love, the blessing of peace, and the blessing of freedom, the freedom to do what is right. And, and that is the will of God for you. The will of God for you is to, is to stand in a blessing. Remember Abram. Abram, God bless Abram, right? But the blessing of Abram is not just for him. It's not just for all these people that we know that God bless. But God bless Abram. He bless Abram and the blessing of Abram is yours. It belongs to you through Jesus Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. Give a hands to the Lord. Hallelujah. Can we sing that one more time? We find this fire. Come on, church, say it. This is the will of God for you. 
Thy dark spots desire. You used to be holy. Now he wants you to be holy. He wants you to be righteous. Holy. Set apart for you, Lord. I used to be holy. Set apart for you, my master. Ready to do your will. Ready to do your will. Ready to do your will. Yes, Lord, we receive it today, Lord. We are ready to do your will, O Lord God, and let your will be done in our lives in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. You may be seated now. We welcome a brother Felix here to come and give us that exhortation for tithes and offering. Hallelujah. Almighty and blessing God, we pray to thee to help us and assist us to understand your word to understand your Bible, to understand everything that's being taught in there. God, we pray to thee this morning for all those who are in need, really in need. God, please assist them. Please find a way. Please find every means to support these people. And in the name of the Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. amen. Yeah. Um, we're here this morning to talk about tithes and offering. Tithes and offering is something that's been in the centuries, supporting communities and also supporting ministries. Um, we talk to everybody here today that anybody that has something to support their ministry should do that. And that's the only way the ministry can go on. And it says in, um, it says in uh, Deuteronomy 8, verses 18, and it goes, it says, but remember the Lord your God. For it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth and so confirms his covenant, which he swore to your ancestors as it is today. Um, we all know that um, people think sometimes that they don't have it, so they don't want to give it or they get so selfish. They want so many things and forget about the word of God and supporting God's ministry. Anybody that thinks that at long last end up not having even what they want because they're not always satisfied with what they have. Giving means not just thinking you don't have, but giving means being able to give what you can give and not what you think has to be given. It doesn't have to be a lot of uh, worth to give. It can also be a support for the church. It doesn't always have to be money or any valuable thing of that sort but just to support your church is a great thing to do and therefore anybody that's here today whatever you have to support it's okay and those who are not here can also go online and support our ministry in the name of the savior jesus christ amen thank you felix for that exhortation all right um so the episode is uh, now we're going to abram's story so Miki is going to tell us about all of this. So uh, let's invite Miki to come here, our worship leader here. There you go. Let's pray for Miki and God be with him. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today, Lord. Thank you for this wonderful man here that willing to serve you and give everything for you, Lord God. And I just pray that you will come, Holy Spirit, to anoint him a double portion of anointing, Lord Jesus. Bring that word and empowerment to your people, Lord God. We want to hear you today, Lord. We want your Holy Spirit to move in power, Lord God. So let use Miki, Lord, as a vessel, Lord. Cover him under your wings, oh Lord Jesus. People may see, may, may see you, not him. People may hear you, not him, oh Lord God. Bless him, O oh Lord God. We put your words to his mouth, Lord Jesus, and bless him today and so that he will be a blessing to many more, Lord God, to all of us that are here to listen. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, hello, everybody. 
Good to be here again, sharing the word of the Lord with you. I enjoy it every time, and I learn something new every single time. So uh, thank you, guys. Uh, before I start, I just want to uh, thank everybody who's um, lifted a prayer for my Uncle John. If you don't know, he's uh, been in the hospital recently. Last year, he had a brain aneurysm, and he's been in and out of the hospital since. And... Uh, you know, so I just want to thank you guys. Just continue to pray. We've seen God move miracles before, and uh, we're just continually praying that God's will will be done in his life and in the lives of his family. Amen. So thank you. Thank you for that. I want to start by saying I believe that we're in a time where uh, there is testing of faith. Mm -hmm. Now, the Bible says that every time that we receive a word that we should test it. When every, every word that we hear, every message that we hear, that we should test it and put it to the test. And at the same time, sometimes our faith gets put to the test. You know, like this whole situation with my family, the whole situation, Lord, with all the things going on, it's, it's been a test of faith. And uh, I just want to thank everybody who's been on this journey with us, with NUMA, uh, this journey you know some of you guys have been with us since we were in uh our old bethany church and um and since then we've moved to a couple different locations and you know i feel like it's like a, a we're like the the israelite people we're going from place to place wandering trying until we reach that promised land and i want to thank all of you guys who've been on this journey with us because it it has been a journey of faith just like what we're going to learn about today. The Bible says in James chapter 1, verse 2, it says, Count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produce patience. Isn't that kind of weird? That when our faith is tested, when we're going through a trial, that the product, the reward of our trial is patience? That's kind of weird, right? And what that means is when we go through a trial, when we go through a test of our faith, the end result should be more faith, Amen. more faith, patience, more faith. It doesn't say that the testing of our faith produces, you know, miracles and, and signs and wonders. It, it could, but the, the ultimate outcome is patience, is more faith. The greater trial that you overcome, the, 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 the even greater trials that you will go through. That's just how it is. But the reward is great. The reward is plentiful. Let patience, the, the, the verse continues, but let patience have its perfect work that you might be perfect and complete. Perfect and complete, lacking nothing. See, God works in our patience. He's putting everything together behind the scenes. Every time we go through a test and a trial, you know, one thing that we'll always go through a time of waiting, a time, a period where we're just waiting to receive, waiting to hear, waiting to see God move that mountain. Every test of our faith, there will come a time, everything in your life, when you're praying for something, when you're, when you're going through a test of faith, you will always go through a time of waiting. But God works in that patience. He works in our waiting. He's putting everything together, not for, for our sake, so that we would be ready to receive the reward, so that we would be ready. The Israelites wandered in the desert for 40 years. And in that 40 years, God was not idle. He wasn't, he wasn't holding, his, holding back his voice. He wasn't holding back his presence. But no, he was preparing the people. He was preparing the people to inherit the promised land. He knew that if they went straight to the promised land, that they would not be ready to take care of it. But the 40 years of, it, of their journey was God preparing them, putting everything together so that they may be perfect when they inherit that. It's like, you know, uh, how many of you guys are cooking, right? How many of you guys like to cook, right? A lot of you guys, right? It's one of my favorite things to cook with is a slow cooker, right? Because all you got to do is put everything in, then you press the button, and then you just wait, right? Sometimes it takes like eight hours or 
or five hour, you know, 10 hours to cook that. Sometimes you're cooking it overnight. Like when you, when you slow cook a turkey or when you slow cook a ham, you know, you want that hand to be juicy. You want it to absorb all the juices. And to do that, it takes time. Sometimes that's like with us. When we rush something, when we just stir fry something real quick and it takes five minutes, that meat is not going to be, it's going to be tough. It's going to be chewy. But when you slow cook something and it, it, it takes, it might take an hour, it might take eight hours, 10 hours, but at the end it comes out juicy and soft and it's full of the nutrient. It absorbs everything. And that's how God works with us sometimes. He puts us in our, the slow cooker of faith. He lets us absorb all the lessons, absorb all the emotions, absorb everything going on around us, every word. He waits until it sinks in to us. He waits until it is fully ingrained in us, until we fully understand it and consume it, and then the product. So he puts everything together. That's why they say he puts everything together in his time. And the story of Abraham, Abraham is the story of his journey of faith. It's a, it, he was already an elderly man. And during those first 70 years, God was preparing him. So we begin our journey with Genesis chapter 12, the story of Abraham. Before he was Abraham, he was called Abraham. Genesis chapter 12 says, the Lord said to Abraham, leave your native country, your relatives and your father's family and go to the land that I will show you. And I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous. And you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who, who bless you and curse those who treat you harshly. All the families on the earth will be blessed through you. So Abraham departed as the Lord had instructed. Wow. So this was Abraham's first act of faith. The Lord had called on him one day. The Lord had called on him and told him to leave his father's household, to leave his homeland, to leave all that he knew. You see, he didn't tell him the reason why, like you would, he didn't tell him step by step. He just told him the first step, the first step, which was to leave. Isn't that funny how God works? Sometimes he doesn't tell us everything right away. He doesn't tell us his entire plan right away. Why is that? Well, I believe that if the Lord did tell us everything right away, start to finish our whole life, we wouldn't have faith to believe him that it was real. <laughs> if the Lord was telling me that 10 years ago that I would be here in this moment with you guys right now, I probably wouldn't believe him. There's so much blessing in my life that I wouldn't believe him if he told me. If the Lord had told me that I were going to marry a, a Philippine <laughs> and travel around the world, I, I, I maybe wouldn't believe him. And maybe it's the same for you. If the Lord had told you where you were today and he told you 10, 15, 20 years ago, maybe you wouldn't believe him. God's blessing, his journey is so great and we cannot comprehend it. In the same way, 10 years from now, 10, five years from now, 15 years from now, it's the same. You, you probably wouldn't believe where God would take you, even if he told you today. And that was with Abraham. He, God just told him the first step, leave your house, walk out the door, go to the next door land, and I'll show you what to do next. Right? It's, it's not a way, God directs us in a way that we can succeed. See, the step was simple, just to leave. He didn't tell him, okay, you're going to go, and then you're going to meet this guy in Pharaoh, and then you're going to explain this, and then you're going to go here. and then you're gonna... he, he didn't tell him that all right away. But he leads him in a way that he can succeed. It was a simple command just to leave his household. And that's the same way that God does with us. He tells us things that we can do. The Lord would never command you to do something that you couldn't do. The steps are always Simple. That's his grace and his love for us. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8 says, By faith, by faith, Abraham, when he, when called to go to a place 
he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. See, that's the step of faith. Many times in life, we don't know where we're going. We don't know where God is taking us. But the Lord has promised us things, and we don't know how. Maybe the Lord has promised you that you were going to go to a certain nation, that you're going to see a certain miracle, that you're going to receive a certain reward, but you don't know how. That's a good thing. <laughs> That's a good thing because he would never promise you something that you could never achieve. He can never promise you something that he didn't have a way for you to receive. See, Abraham knew. Abraham knew that he would never see the promise until he took the action. That's why it says faith without works is dead because your faith should motivate you and push you to put that faith to the test. Just like we talked about earlier, James chapter two, verse 17, faith by itself, if it does not have works is dead. It's like when you're driving a car, right? I have faith that when I press this gas pedal, the car is going to move forward. I have faith that when I press the brake pedal, the car is going to stop. If I did not have faith in the car, I, I probably wouldn't trust it. I'd probably try to, another way to stop the car or get the car moving, right? It's the same with God. He puts our, we put our faith into action. And, and many times that action is something that we already know. The Lord has already told us. Just like Abraham, his only requirement was to go. The Lord promises Abraham four things in this scripture, right? He promises him four things. Did I do this right? Okay. So the first one, by faith, Abraham leaves home. Abraham left all he knew to follow the Lord. There are four things that the Lord has promised him. Number one, I will make you a great nation. Number two, I will make you famous so you can be a blessing to others. Number three, I will bless you. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. And number four, all families will be blessed through you. Amen. So these are the four promises that God had made to Abraham. I want you to keep these in mind as we go and learn about his story, as we learn about Abraham. See, Abraham, he was not a perfect person. He had his flaws too. He was a human just like us. Sometimes we think that the people and the characters in the Bible, they were, they were extraordinary, and that's why God used them. They were just uh, select people with, with certain amazing skills. They were like heroes. That's why God used them. But if you read the stories, like how we've been reading, like Adam and Eve, like Cain and Abel, the people that he used, they were all flawed. They were human. They needed grace, just like us. And just like Abraham, he was not a perfect person. As soon as the Lord had promised these things to Abraham and Abraham left his country and went to the land of Cana, he was tested. He was tested with famine. There was a famine in the land. So Abraham had to leave and go to Egypt. So right away, when, when Abraham gets this promise, that promise that you are going to be a great nation, that you're going to have, uh, uh, you're, you're going to be famous, that you will bless other people right when he receives this promise. He gets tested right away, tested with a famine in the land that God had promised him. And so he goes to Egypt. And we really see what kind of person that Abraham was. Abraham was in Egypt. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 2 says, you will remember all the ways which the Lord has led you in the wilderness so he can humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart. So the purpose of these tests was to know what was in Abraham's heart. The same way the, the, the reason why you go through trials is to reveal what is really in your heart. Chapter uh, 12, verse 11 says this. As he went about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife, Sarai, I know what a beautiful woman you are. When the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me and let you live. 
Say you are my sister so that I will be treated well for your sake and my life will be spared because of you. So we see more of Abraham's kind of character flaws. He wasn't made perfect yet. Here we see him kind of showing fear, showing doubt, showing a little bit of selfishness, offering his wife, right? And he was, wasn't technically lying because Sarah was his half-sister, but he wasn't really telling the truth. He wasn't really bearing witness. So we see what kind of person he was. He was a regular person, just like you, just like me. But the important part, God had still honored his promise to Abraham. Even through his mistakes, even through his flaws, even through his lie, his fear, his selfishness and doubt. We read in verse 14, when Abraham came to Egypt. When Abraham came to Egypt, the Egyptians saw that Sarai was a beautiful, very beautiful woman. And when Pharaoh's officials saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh and she was taken into his palace. He treated Abraham well for her sake. And Abraham acquired sheep and cattle, male and female donkeys, male and female servants and camels. But the Lord inflicted serious disease on Pharaoh and his household because of Abraham's wife. So Pharaoh summoned Abraham. What have you done to me? He said. Why didn't you tell me she was your wife? What did you say? Why did you say she is my sister? So I took her to be my wife. Now then, here's your wife. Take her and go. Then Pharaoh gave orders about Abraham to his men, and they sent him on his way with his wife and everything he had. You see how God had honored his word to Abraham, even through the deception, through his lies. God had honored him. He said, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. And even though he was a flawed man, God had honored him. Let me tell you what, no matter how many times you might stumble, no how many, how many times you might backslide, God has your back. His word is never revoked. His promises to you are never revoked. He may have shown you where you're going to be. He may have given you a dream. He may have given you a promise. Maybe you see yourself in 10 years in a different place with a different, with a, 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 a certain ministry, right? Even no matter how many times you may have made a mistake, no matter how many times, God still honors that word to you, just like how he did with Abraham. I'm not making an excuse for sin. I'm not making an excuse for you to just go on and, and live your life of sin. Because we got to remember that God is also a God of justice. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> and because of Abraham's sin in Egypt, the Israelites were enslaved. They were enslaved for many years. So even though God still honors his word, there was still a cost. There was still a price to Abraham's deception. See, God is 100% love. And he's 100% wrath. God hates sin 100%. There's no tolerance. Mm -hmm. And God hates sin because of his love for us. Amen. Because of his love for us, God hates sin. Why do you hate cancer? Why do you hate cancer in your son? Because you love your son. Yeah. Why? My wife tells me all the time, I don't like it when you work late. Why does she hate when I work late? Because she loves me. She wants to spend time with me. <laughs> it's the same. God is the same way. He hates sin because it takes you away from him because of his love for you. That's why it's good that when you, that's why it says in the Bible that God disciplines those he loves. Just like how you would discipline your child. You discipline your child because you love them. Because you want them to know the truth. And God is the same way with us. He loves us. But he hates the sin in our life. So he dealt with Israel for their sin. By giving them unto the Egyptians to pay what, what Abraham had done. We read in Genesis chapter 13. I just want to make sure I'm on the right thing here. So Abraham, by faith, Abraham is blessed 
in Egypt. Egypt was a foreign place, but Abraham trusted God would take care of him, take care of him and Sarah remained faithful to his promise that he would bless him. Genesis chapter 13, verse 11, verse 1 to uh, 13 says, So Abraham left Egypt with Sarai and everything he had, and, and he took Lot with him. Abraham became very wealthy in livestock and in silver and gold. He came to Bethel, and there Abraham called on the name of the Lord. Now Lot, who was with Abraham, also had flocks and herds and tents, but the Lord could not support them together. Oh, but the land could not support them together, for their possessions were so great. So Abraham said to Lot, let's part company. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. And if you go to the right, I will go to the left. So Lot looked around and saw that the whole plain of the Jordan was well watered, like the, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt. So Lot chose for himself the whole plain of Jordan and the two parted ways. So here we see another step of Abraham's faith. See, God had promised him the land of Canaan. He had promised him a land of, of fruit. And Abraham looked to his right and he saw that land that was well watered, that was full with the valley. And then he looked to his left and he saw the, the deserted lands. And he still allowed Lot to choose. Lot, go ahead and choose which one. It's very obvious which one that Lot would choose. Of course, he chose the one that was well watered. But Abraham did not falter in his faith because the Lord had promised him, I would take you to a land. I would take you to inherit a land and make you a great nation. I will bless you. And he trusted that word. He trusted that word so much that when Lot, he let Lot choose which where where he would want to go and when lot chose the well-watered land abraham abraham was fine he was content with it and remember that the lord had also said that i will curse those who deal with you harshly and we all know what happened to lot or if you don't we'll learn about it next week <laughs> you see God has that way with us. There is consistent testing in our lives. Maybe you've been waiting like five or 10 years for something to happen, for a promise that God has given to you. Maybe you've been praying every day, every week about something, right? Don't stop praying. Somebody once asked me, why do I need to pray more than one time for something? If I am going through something, why do I need to keep praying? God heard my prayer already. He knows. Well, you know what? That prayer is for us. It's to make us right. See, God doesn't need our prayers to move. He doesn't need our prayers to work. But he needs us. He needs us to be, to be worked on. And so when we pray, it does more for us. It's to position us. It's to ready our heart. It's so that when we do receive that reward, when we do receive that blessing, that fruit, it's that much more rewarding. It's that much more fulfilling and satisfying. I always use kids because kids teach you a lot about the Lord. If the kid will ask you something over and over and over and over again, and you finally do what they say, they're going to really rejoice and be happy. I was taking care of, of like these little kids. I used to take care of these little kids, right? And they would always beg me, I want to go to the park. I want to go to the park. I want to go to the park. And I would never take them to the park, right? But the moment that I said, okay, we'll go to the park, they screamed and yelled and shouted. <laughs> it's, it's the same with us. When we ask the Lord, it readies us to receive. It prepares us to receive that reward. Let's continue on. See, Abraham was, let's continue on to uh, the next verse. Actually. So Abraham, by faith. He gives the first choice to Lot. Abraham believed he would receive the land that God promised him, no matter what land that Lot chose. Okay, let's move on. The Lord said to Abraham after Lot had parted from him, look around where, from where you are, to the north and to the south, to the east 
and the west. All the land that you see, I will give you and your offspring forever. I will make your offspring like the dust of the earth, so that if anyone could count the dust, then your offspring could be counted. Go walk through the length and breadth of the land, for I'm giving it to you. So we see a new promise that God has given him. Abraham was starting to see the fulfillment of his, the four promises already. He was already expanding and growing. He already had the wealth, the silver. He had the land. He had received that, that land already. He was living in it already. He had seen the blessing on his families, right? And like uh, how Lot was so blessed, right? He had seen how through him God has worked. So he's already starting to see this. And right in the middle of this, God challenges him with a new promise, with a new promise. He told Abraham, everything that you see, I will give to you and your family. And the second promise, I will make your offspring countless. See, Abraham had faith to believe in the first four things that the Lord had told him. But these next two things were a bit more challenging. Abraham knew that Sarai was, was barren, that she couldn't produce any offering, any offspring. He knew that the land around him that Lot had given him was a barren land. It was already, it was mostly desert and, and unfarmable. See, these things required another level of faith, another step of faith. And that's how God works in our lives as well. When we, sometimes when you go to school, right, you take a quiz. And the reason why you take those quizzes is so that the day of the test, the day of the exam, you know all the answers. You know you are prepared and you are ready. See, God was giving Abraham these quizzes. He's giving him these things because he knows that there will be a test. A final test. We'll talk more about that later. But these things, you see how God works through Abraham, preparing him little by little. The Bible says we go from glory to glory, from one level of faith to another level of faith. We don't realize that faith requires testing. It requires us to be challenged. Faith comes from hearing and hearing from the word of God. That's what the word says. The more that we hear God, the more that we know God, the more that we learn of God, the more that our faith grows. But at the same time, we also need to consider the more uh, trials and testing there will be in life. So if you really want to know God, that's why the Bible says there's a cost. Nobody counts a cost. Nobody builds a building without first counting the cost. And we really see Abraham counting the cost as he's following the Lord. Now this, his faith was really beginning to be tested. If you ever feel stuck in your faith, stuck in your walk of God, maybe you feel like sometimes you plateau, like your faith isn't growing anymore. Sometimes you f we, we all feel like that, and that's a normal thing to feel. Maybe you already saw God move in your life before, so you've kind of grown content. you kind of grown happy with where you are. See, but God is always moving. And even though Abraham started to see the fulfillment of his promises, he didn't stop listening to God. He didn't stop hearing from God. He continued. And we know that immediately after this, Abraham was tested again. There was a war in the land. There were kings rising up against other kings. That's what the Bible says in Genesis chapter 14. That kings started to rise up against other kings. And Abraham and Lot, who had went to Sodom, had been captured. So it says this. Um, when Abraham heard that Lot, his relative, had been taken captive, he called out 318 trained men born in his household and went in pursuit. During the night, Abraham divided his men to attack them, and he routed them, pursuing them as far as 
Hoba, north of Damascus. He, he recovered all the goods and brought back his relative lot and his possessions together with the women and the other people. You see, as soon as Abraham received this word that everywhere he sees, that's going to be his, what happened? There was war over that land. See, there were four armies. There were four kingdoms that joined together, and they fought another five armies, five kingdoms. See, and we see here, Abraham only had 318 men. You imagine four kingdoms joining together, how much numbers that they might have. Or five kingdoms joining together, how much numbers they might have. And they were at war with each other. And here's Abraham with only 300 people. But what did Abraham do? He believed in the word that the Lord would give him this land. So he went out to fight. He took his 300 men and he fought. And he rescued Lot from the, the kingdom, the, from the army of four kings. See, Abraham knew that the Lord had given him this land. He knew that all that he saw was his. And he put that to the test. He put that into action. When he defeated the army, the four armies with his 300 men, he received so much praise. People were coming to him from left and from right. And one of those people was the high priest, Melchizedek. Now, who is Melchizedek? I, he's mentioned actually a lot in the Bible. But in this scripture, there's only a few scriptures here. Right? Melchizedek was the king of Salem. Let's read a little bit more about it. Then Melchizedek, the king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God most high, and he blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram by God most high, creator of heaven and earth. And praise be to God most high, who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abram gave him a tenth of everything. All right, I want to read a little bit more. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abraham. I am your shield and your very great reward. So we see Melchizedek, who is this king of Salem. He was a king, and at the same time, he was a priest. Now, that was really unheard of during this time, that someone would be a king and also a priest. Usually, if you are a priest, you aren't a king. And if you are a king, you don't, you're not a priest. But Melchizedek was both. He had a kingdom and he was a priest of the Lord. He brought with him, he was the king of Salem. Salem would later be named Jerusalem. So here's Melchizedek, one of the first kings of Jerusalem, coming to Abraham, bringing bread and wine. So why would he bring bread and wine? Well, this was a foreshadowing. It was a prophecy of how Jesus would later give bread and wine to his disciples by giving his life. See, at this time, Abraham had committed many sins. He had murdered. He had gone out. He was a righteous man by faith. But he was also a sinful man by his action. He had committed murder. He had uh, uh, committed lies in Egypt. And this bread and this wine was a way that God would atone with him. That God would forgive him. Because we know that God would establish a covenant with him. And this covenant with Abraham required him to be cleansed required him to be made right with the Lord. So the king, Melchizedek, brought with him bread and wine. He was a priest of, it says here, the Most High God. God Most High. 
in this in this time they would call this the the priest of Yahweh the priest of Yahweh the one and true God so as a representative of the kingdom Melchizedek's name also meant peace and righteousness so you see all these ways that God had been faithful to his promises to Abraham. And this was the high point of his faithfulness. That God would send Melchizedek, the servant, the high priest, to come and bless him. So that way he could receive the covenant, which we'll learn about in the next week. And the Lord came to Abraham and said to him in a vision, Do not be afraid. I am your shield and your reward. So for Abraham's faithfulness, for his, his belief that God would, would fulfill and meet all his promises, the Lord gave him the best reward that you could get. Himself, his presence as your shield. That means that no matter what you would do, that Abraham would find favor with the Lord. These scriptures have been about Abraham's journey of faith. And this is only the beginning. Abraham was tested over and over again. The reason why he was tested was so the Lord would know what was truly in his heart. What was truly, what he was truly made of. And after he had endured these tests, he was blessed by Melchizedek. The first priest. I don't want to get really theological with you, but in Hebrews, it talks about the order of Melchizedek. I'll just share a little bit. It talks about the order of Melchizedek and how Jesus had been higher. Jesus, the, the order of Jesus was higher and greater than that of Melchizedek. And we know this because Jesus, the, every, when you make a sacrifice to atone for your sin, you would have to bring a pure and a spotless lamb see that's why abraham gave him a, a tenth of everything he was atoning he was giving a, a tithe to bless melchizedek to atone for the things that he had done because it required sacrifice it required sacrifice from him to be made right and melchizedek as the first priest this was a tradition that was carried on over and over again, that people would bring their sacrifices to the Lord as a tithe, as an offering to the high priest. And the high priest would then offer that unto the Lord. So you need a mediator. And Melchizedek was that mediator to prepare God's covenant with Abraham. And the Bible says in the New Testament that Jesus came to do away with that. That his order was higher and greater than that. That was established by Melchizedek. Meaning that Jesus had paid the ultimate price. That there was no longer this need to have a priest as a mediator. To have a priest as somebody who would communicate for you to God. That there wasn't that need anymore because Jesus had come to establish a new order. An order that was higher than Melchizedek in which his people and his children will deal directly with God. And we know that that mediator and that medium is through Jesus. So when he says that he established his order, he wiped away with the need. That's why we can come to the Lord directly. We can come to Jesus directly. And we can pray in his name. That's why we pray in his name. When we pray to God, we always pray in Jesus' name. And we pray that because there's no way that we, in our sinful selves, could communicate with God because of our sin. But when we pray through Jesus, when we pray through his name, through the name of Jesus, all of our sins are born. With him, we become born again through Jesus, through Christ. So that was 
the explanation of why the order of Jesus is greater than that of Melchizedek. So let's consider this as we continue to study the word of Abraham. As we continue to look into the story, we're just in the beginning. Next week, we get into the real meat of, of Abraham's faith. Why he was considered one of the most faithful. Why he was considered an example of faith to all the Jews. See, God had fulfilled his promises to Abraham thus far. But there was yet another test that he would have to go through. So let's pray. Let's close. And let's ask the Lord that he would work in us in the same way that he works with Abraham. Lord, I pray, Lord God, that this message today would resonate in us. It would resonate in our hearts. Lord, if you can use Abraham, Abraham, a flawed man, Lord, I believe you could use us in the same way. Lord, I believe that today you're calling us to go outside of our comfort zone, just like what you did with Abraham, to leave our household, to leave what we know, to leave what we have always known to follow your voice, to follow your call. And Lord, I pray, Lord, that you would strengthen us with the strength that Abraham was strengthened with, that we may have the obedience, the drive, the patience to go through. Lord, I pray that you would test us and refine us. Put us through these trials that we may come out stronger, that we would come out higher that's why you said in your word to rejoice and so we rejoice today this morning and i pray that this word would stay with us it would it would it would encourage us every time we hear it and i thank you god for your word today in jesus name amen amen one more one more thing real quick before we go uh i just want to pray that god would really release this this time is a very significant time. And I, pr- I just really want to pray that God would release a, a, a season of faith over us, that our faith would grow. I believe God responds not to our need, but to our faith. But it's a good thing that even faith the size of a mustard seed can move. Amen? Amen. The blessing of Abraham now is no longer Abraham, is Abraham. Right? How many of you be, knows the sing that when I was a kid, I was there's a children's song they call it Father Ab- Father Abraham, seven children, like you know, Father Abraham. I don't know if you know that song, but that song is it, just a song of blessing to many. It's not only seven children that Father Abraham has, but all all children all throughout the entire of the world who, the, who believe in God, who believe in Jesus, who have relationship with the Lord, who have relationship with God, has received that blessing that comes from, that God bless Abram. And that blessing is not only for Abram, but that blessing of Abram is yours. It belongs to you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of all these blessings that God has promised to people from the very beginning. And and that's what we need to hold on. We need to grab hold of of what God has in store for us. God has stores for you a blessing. The true blessings of God is the blessings of love, joy, peace, and hope. And when you have those, when you have that possession of joy, peace, and hope, and love. I, 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 assurely tell, I surely tell you that when you have that, you will never be worried. You will never be afraid. You will ne- you'll never get that fear of what is ahead. You'll never get that worry or, or, or something that you think too much about what would be the next day in your life. Because you have peace, you have that joy, you have that blessing. You have that promise that God has promised from the very beginning. Amen. 
And and today that's what we're trying we we're asking God for to to bring that in our thoughts. To bring that in our thoughts that this is God's promise for me. Not this world that because many of us probably struggle today you struggle of many things in life and you keep thinking about those struggles you keep thinking you keep thinking about those things that that doesn't give you peace that doesn't give you joy actually those things put you down and those things that are worldly things but if you know if you think about godly things which is the will of god for you is to bless you and the promise of god for you is to love you is to give you hope and a future that is that what you need to think about things about heavenly things and not the worldly things do not think what you can do what you can do but things about what can he do for you because he is god that is able I am not able but because of God I am able to do but and I'm able to 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 reach out the promise of God in my life. Colossians 3 verse 1 to 3 says Paul says that think about the things that is heavenly and do not think about the things do not think about the things that are worldly and let's focus our mind because we don't want those we don't want this mind or our thoughts to control our lives we want to control our thoughts instead the thoughts that we have controlling us you are able to do it so because you have Jesus in you and the power of the holy ghost will come upon you and give you that strength that strength that comes from god and that helps that comes from god amen how many of you believe that i believe that so let's stand lord we believe with your promises you have promised us to bless us to bless us the whole thing that from the very beginning the promise that you have for us the very beginning that you created us to be holy to be like you to, you created us in our own image and you want that to be restored in us and that is the true blessing to have relationship with you to be with you forever and that is the true blessing god to be to be you as our father and us as your children as what we said in your word lord i will bless you so you will be a blessing and that promise lord give us the hope not just only for ourselves but hope for others that are not belong to you yet because there are many people out there lord jesus they're still seeking for the truth they're still searching for what they're that they're trying to look for something that they're what they're looking for that they, they could not found but the truth is there only one thing that man needs to be searched for and that is who you are lord and once they found you once they once they see you lord the promise of yours will be given to them as what you bless us you will also bless them and here we are lord use us lord jesus because we are blessed we are so blessed because we have you and use us lord god to be a blessings to many to impart these blessings that we have thank you god lord i pray this blessings that you have for all of us which is the grace may the lord bless you and keep you may his face shine upon you and be gracious to you 
that you may and and may he lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace and this is the blessing that comes from god the peace the joy the love and comfort that you need and the hope the hope of glory and eternal life i pray this in jesus name amen and amen amen praise the lord hallelujah well thank you for joining us today if you have any prayer requests if you have any things that you would like to be part uh, to, to, to impart with us and 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 share with us and we'd love to pray for you we are every day open 24 7 amen god bless you all and i love you all thank you for joining us see you next week